Hi, everyone. I'm Lucy Siegel. I am a writer, a broadcaster and journalist based in the UK, and I specialise in climate and nature stories. Welcome to the Be a Net Zero Hero podcast, part of the Be the Change series of conversations organised by One Carbon World in collaboration with the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Now, One Carbon World is a climate positive, not for profit organisation and an official observer organisation of the UNFCCC. They're registered in the UK and have operations in over 32 countries, offering advice and support on measuring, reducing and rebalancing the emissions of small and large organisations. COP28 will be a milestone moment when the world will take stock of its progress on the Paris Agreement. The first global stock take will provide a comprehensive assessment of progress since adopting the Paris Agreement. This will help align efforts on climate action, including measures that need to be put in place to bridge the gaps in progress. And we know there are some of those. As every year, One Carbon World is attending the UN summit. They have showcased inspirational stories at COP25 in Madrid, COP26 in Glasgow, my favourite, and COP27 in Sharm El Sheikh. They have also had the honour to measure the emissions of COP27 and issue the official COP27 verification report and COP27 sustainability report for the Egyptian government. This year, they want to show the world their journey towards net zero and would love to tell you some more inspirational stories too. This second episode is called Nature and Carbon Removals, a really interesting topic indeed. Together, we will find out more about the power of nature-based solutions, a phrase which we hear a lot now, and green assets. We'll hear how forestry and regenerative agriculture can bridge the gap to net zero through carbon sequestration in soils. Now, before we invite our first guests, we would like to ask some questions to Steve Kenzie, Executive Director at the UN Global Compact Network UK, who will tell us more about their work around sustainable development goals and their support to businesses and organisations. I'll start by talking about the, the bigger picture, the UN Global Compact. We are the largest corporate sustainability initiative globally. There's more than 23,000 participants in the initiative. It's a UN-backed corporate sustainability initiative. It started in 2000 when then UN Secretary General Kofi Annan saw the problems of globalization where we had companies shifting production to developing countries in pursuit of lower costs, but they weren't shifting standards around working conditions and business practices along with them. And, and we had some real problems with um, children making footballs. Uh, those of us of an age will remember the, those scandals. He recognized that we needed a global standard for responsible business. And he had a brilliant insight that we could draw from existing UN agreements that had already been accepted around the world. And so the UN Global Compact has as its foundation 10 universal principles that have been drawn from UN treaties in the areas of human rights, labor, environment, and anti-corruption. Our work is to work with our participants to help inspire greater ambition, give them skills and knowledge to enable action around that ambition, and we seek to shape the wider environment for sustainability. To join us is very simple. The CEO of the organization, however large or small, wherever it's located, just needs to make um, three commitments. Firstly, to operationalize our 10 principles throughout their organizations, to report annually on the progress that they're making towards doing so, and finally, to support the wider UN development agenda, which is best expressed right now by the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Thank you so much, Steve, for sharing with us the importance of voluntary climate action. Now I'd like to leap into this next episode, inviting our first guest, who will speak about the importance of green assets. We have Jonathan Sutton joining us today. Now, Jonathan is the Group Chief Sustainability Officer of Westphalia Fruit Group. 
Westphalia Fruit is a leading multinational supplier of fresh fruit and related products to international markets. Through their vertically integrated supply chain, they grow, source and ripen, pack, process and market quality avocados and other produce across the year and across the globe, including Southern Africa, Chile, Colombia, Peru and the US, among others. Thank you, Jonathan, for your time. It's so great to have you on this podcast. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, yes, I feel I feel that we've really managed to like get you sitting in one place for a little while, um, and I'm going to um, use that time very wisely. Now, Westphalia Fruit are known as leaders in the soil carbon sequestration from agriculture. Why is it important to remove more carbon in this way? Yeah, thanks, Lucy. Well, we know that the planet is heating up and removing carbon to keep the temperature rise below two degrees Celsius makes complete sense which is why Westphalia believe that sequestering carbon in our soils and our trees is a logical step to take. We don't disturb the soil once the orchards are planted and our trees are generally in the ground for around 50 years. We also return all of the tree prunings in mulches and chippings back into the orchards to lock carbon in the strata as best as we can. We're all impacted by weather extremes, but particularly El Nino and La Nina, um, which are affecting rising temperatures. They have a large impact in tropical agriculture with our yield or quality changes and variations. These in turn impact the financial stability of a thousand odd growers that we have in our network and also the communities that rely on the trade that we provide. Our crops thrive in stable weather conditions, not too hot, not too cold, not too wet, not too dry. Um, these conditions are becoming less consistent and as we adapt, to, we need to adapt to deal with these changing conditions. We've taken steps not only to purchase green energy from our, for our offices and pack houses, but also to generate our own through solar, which is also removing carbon from the supply chains and support the overall removal needs. As we upgrade our facilities over time, we will remove the fossil fuel boilers and replace with higher efficiency green powered systems. OK, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, I'm really struck by the way that you describe how reliant you are on stable ecosystems, because this is a great passion of mine to try and articulate this the whole time, because obviously you're so connected to the soil and the growing conditions. I mean, you're completely dependent and most of us are quite removed. So it's a really interesting opportunity to learn from you, as it were. I also noticed that you say Westphalia and I said Westphalia. I think that's a hangover from when I studied history. So I will now revert to Westphalia, which is the correct yes. pronunciation. Um, tomato, tomato. Exactly. Tomato, tomato. Yeah, that's, we won't call the whole thing off, though. OK, so um, let's talk a little bit about how you connect to setting emission reduction targets so why did Westphalia Fruit sign up for the Science-Based Targets Initiative and how do you want to achieve net zero? Yeah, Westphalia believe that as one of the leading avocado businesses or one of the leading fruit businesses in the world, we should operate under the highest level of scrutiny and independent validation. So we're not just saying what we're doing. Other people are looking and validating exactly what we're doing. And the Science-Based Target Initiative gives us this and it holds us to account we can also compare ourselves against other companies in the same sector to know how we're doing based on the same criteria. And the launch of the flag guidance through SBTIs in 2023 really helped us with our thinking towards a net zero world. We will achieve net zero with a combined strategy of both reduction in our carbon footprint by doing more of the right things that we can, but also using the green asset or our trees that we have on our farms to remove carbon. So that removal and reduction strategy going hand in hand. We'll change our energy suppliers to provide green sources and we'll generate more of our energy through solar panels on the roof spaces and also where we can um, use spare land to power remote systems like our irrigation pumps. Our big challenge is our scope three emissions are a significant portion of our footprint and that relies on our suppliers and growers also taking action to reduce their footprint which therefore reduces ours. We're taking a proactive approach to this challenge by demonstrating through our own business the art of the possible and leading by example. So we can't expect a supplier to do something that we're not prepared to do ourselves. And we've identified a, a small farm in South Africa, it's about 250 hectares, and we're gonna create a plan to create the best practice approach to, towards a net zero on this unit. 
it's a balanced approach. So it's a it's an avocado farm. It also has timber forestry. Um, it has um, cattle through grazing and uh, and grass grass pastures as well. So it's quite a unique um, farm in its own right. But we believe there's something there that working together we can actually achieve a net zero farm, which will be unique in the uh, in the world um, and also unique within within our sector. And having this balanced reduction and removal strategy will help us towards our goals. Wow, what's the time frame on the net zero farm? Um, we're going to start in 2024 um, and hopefully by 2030, we will achieve net zero on that unit. Amazing. Um, we've t- we've, you talked a little bit about scope three and we're starting to, to talk about the value chain in your case. So we hear many companies talk of the challenges in measuring the impact of their value chains. What, in your opinion, makes Westphalia different? Yeah, so in 2020, we took a view to measure the whole supply chain and include scope three emissions. So many people look at scope one and scope two, which are within within their reach. Scope three takes it beyond the, their boundary and into, uh, into the value chain. Once we understood where those key drivers were, we, can de- we developed a strategy to focus on it, um, which includes all of our supply partners and growers. It's challenging to request these third-party growers to adopt our values, um, but we believe that we have a lot of people are aligned to the Westphalia values um, in our existing business, and in many cases, the impacts are positive. So reduction in many cases also equals a cost saving or efficiency that was previously unknown. So we're seeing a real balance around um, actually driving efficiency, which also drives change, which delivers carbon, um, carbon measurements and carbon reduction. Water is also a key resource for us. Um, and we did a study in 2022 to really understand what is the impact of our water use in the catchment area. So we're not just looking at ourselves as a unit. We're looking at the communities that we operate within as a key, as a key stakeholder in our business. Um, and then also the growers that also that, that go around where we are. Um, the study formed a basis to our water strategy. So we're not depleting the catchment area and only and therefore only using the water that we need sparingly. I think the key for us that makes us different is finding the right partnerships to support the journey. And it's been a key area of focus really to ensure that the measurements taken are scrutinized at the highest level, which is why we work with One Carbon World, but also have the right mindset and mentality with our supply base. So we're having sensible conversations, not just based on trade, but also based on driving improvements for, uh, for towards our carbon footprint and our carbon journey. Thank you. That's so interesting. Um, I particularly enjoyed hearing about those kind of strategic partnerships. I also have strategic partnerships. I'm giving some of the questioning duties to other people. Um, Are you ready? Because this one is coming from the pupils of Shinfield St. Mary's Junior School. They've got a question for you, Jonathan. This is where we get very serious. Hi, my name is Chamobi. I'm a student from Shinfield St. Mary's Junior School. My question is, what are West Valley Foods doing to make the world more sustainable? Thank you so much for the question. So there we go. What are Westphalia Fruit doing to make the world more sustainable? Jonathan, your thoughts, please. Well, what a fantastic question. Thank you. Um, Westphalia has been measuring our carbon emissions for the past three years. So we have a really good understanding now of where our biggest areas of impact are. We have already reduced our carbon footprints by generating 20% of our own energy through solar power systems. And we've reduced our water use by 23% in the last two years. And we'll continue to focus on these two elements because they are key to our business, but also key to the environment we operate in. We're building strong partnerships as we don't have all the answers to many of the questions. And we also see that innovation will will bring solutions in the future, like the challenge of transporting goods across the world sustainably. We've taken a bottom-up approach to the issues and our teams in each business unit are actively working through plans to further reduce their carbon emissions and also continue the focus on water um, where we use it in all of our operations. These will have a positive impact in the regions and also with the communities that we operate within. So we're seen as a force for good in doing the right things. Being sustainable is the only future that Westphalia believe in. And by following our guiding principles and living up to our corporate purpose, which is quite simple, it's to do good, we will ensure that the products we sell today and the communities we work with are still here in 50 years time. We have an ambition to be net zero as a company by 2049, and we're doing absolutely everything we can to achieve this. And we hope you'll, you can be with us on that journey. Thank you.
Thank you so much. I'm sure the pupils from Shinfield St. Mary's will be happy to hear that. Also, the fruit buyers of the future and the fruit eaters of now. Um, thank you, Jonathan. Thanks for your time and your very inspiring work and also your careful and thoughtful articulation of what you do. We really, really appreciate you speaking to us today. Thank you. Thank you. Now, before we move on to the next guests, we will hear some inspirational stories from organisations who are also contributing to climate action. We'll be right back. At Robertson, our purpose is to assure a sustainable future. We work closely with our supply chain to deliver against our responsible business outcomes. We have a sustainable growth agreement with Scotland's Environment Protection Agency. We've partnered with the Supply Chain Sustainability School to develop and host free learning pathways to target high impact areas. And we've launched our Carbon Footprint Plus approach to capture emissions data from our supply chain. OK, we're now moving on to the second part of this episode, where we will discuss regenerative agriculture and its benefits. I would like to welcome Joe Stanley, Head of Training and Partnerships at the Allerton Project from the Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust. Uh, let me give you a bit of background. The Allerton Project researches the effects of different farming methods on wildlife and the environment, sharing results of their research through advisory and educational activities in the UK. Thank you to you. And from Agrivar, we have Konstantin Harilampiev, expert in project financing with a focus on sustainable development. Now, Agrivar is an agricultural company based in Bulgaria that works closely with dozens of farmers to develop new technologies and concrete solutions that address the fight against soil erosion, improve metabolism and increase the financial sustainability of agricultural holdings. Welcome to both of you. Thank you for being here. OK, I'd like to start with some general questions for both of you. How can regenerative agriculture help restore soil health and mitigate climate change? And why is this important? Let's start with you, Joe. So with regenerative agriculture, obviously what we're looking at is two key elements. Um, yes, one, uh, how can we make uh, agriculture more sustainable and more productive, hopefully while utilising less um, external uh, and especially synthetic inputs, things like uh, fuel, things like uh, synthetic fertilisers. Um, so how can we uh, essentially improve the environmental sustainability of food production? Because I think that uh, one of the striking facts is um, that I've heard that we need to produce as much food between 2020 and 2050 globally um, to feed a growing population and of course an increasingly wealthy population as has been produced uh, almost in all of human history up to 2020. But of course we have to do that far more sustainably than has been the case to this date and I think regenerative agriculture uh, does hold out the, the hope um, for a sort of a whole systems change approach to how many uh, food systems operate in order to, to increase that sustainability and of course then we're talking about climate change mitigation so yes uh, we have to be able to, to boost the productivity of our soils to avoid us hopefully having to, to take increased areas of agricultural land into production and to reduce the, the carbon footprint and other of course sustainable sustainability metrics when we need to talk about uh, the sustainability of food production. But then that climate change mitigation is also really important. And this is the exciting, the really exciting part of regenerative agriculture. You know, agriculture, of course, is globally a net contributor to greenhouse gas emissions and various other, um, of course, um, environmental harms. But a regenerative system, the hope for a regenerative system is that actually farms can become uh, a net sink, especially for uh, atmospheric uh, greenhouse gases, especially, of course, carbon dioxide. And that's the really exciting part of regenerative agriculture. Can we produce that high quality food alongside utilizing our soils and other biomass being grown on farm to actually help reduce the levels of CO2 in the atmosphere? Because, of course, um, you know, the really key part around climate change and net zero is even if we hit net zero tomorrow you know if the amount of carbon dioxide that, that we were uh, pumping into the atmosphere stopped overnight tomorrow and we actually stopped pumping fossil fuels uh, into the atmosphere 
the, the amount of warming that we currently have in the atmosphere will remain because, of course, carbon dioxide is a very long-lived greenhouse gas. So that would remain up there for centuries more. So it's not good enough for us just to meet net zero. And of course, as a global society, that is going to be incredibly challenging in and of itself. But we actually also have to find ways to reduce the amount of carbon dioxide already up there in the atmosphere. And by utilizing biomass on farms and particularly uh, our soils, our agricultural soils, Soils, hopefully we can actually sequester uh, carbon from the atmosphere in our soils. And not only does that hopefully take it out of the atmosphere and to actually help to reduce uh, the warming impact of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere, but also that carbon, once it's locked up in our soils, has the potential to help improve uh, the health, structure and productivity of our agricultural soils, thereby boosting um, the, the fertility and the uh, fecundity of our soils. So Regenerative agriculture in combining those two things is potentially a really exciting new development, um, new uh, pathway for agriculture. But of course, the key is um, to get sort of regenerative principles working at scale across the global agricultural sector. And those five key principles are, of course, an increase in diversity, biological diversity across the farm landscape, um, reducing uh, the chemical and the mechanical interventions of our soils, uh, improving the amount of soil cover uh, to protect our soil surface, uh, to have living roots in the, in the in the soil for as much of the year as possible. You know, really um, utilizing those natural uh, those natural uh, solar panels that plants represent. Photosynthesizing, getting that carbon from the atmosphere down into the soil, where it acts as the fuel source for the entire soil biome. And then finally, utilizing uh, organic manures, especially from grazed livestock, and getting them back into uh, into our soils. Because again, it's not enough just to uh, halt the decline of the health of our soils, we need to actually also integrate more organic matter back into those soils. We can do that through uh, things like green manures, uh, through cover crops, but utilizing uh, grazing livestock and the manure that they generate is the best way to breathe uh, you know, organic matter uh, and life back into our degraded soils. So that's why regenerative agriculture is, is so exciting. Thanks, Joe. Uh, Constantine, let's come to you. Thank you, Lucy. It's a great question. Uh, and with our work with, with the Agrovar team, I think we're, we're constantly pushing the boundaries of the benefits that regenerative agriculture could provide. Um, applying the principles of regenerative agriculture um, is something that can really empower uh, modern day farmers by, by giving them and allowing them to to use the data resources which we uh, which we use, and from from that to turn that into into a practical um, practical benefit for their farms, um, our machine learning and AI algorithms analyze a lot of available data, which the farmers already have, but it's about giving it the context that they need in that transition from conventional. To regenerative farming. Uh, we believe that in the following years, this movement of giving data, uh, data specific and tailored software solutions to farmers will, will increase and it will accelerate that transition. And it will even, it will, um, even benefit more the, um, the partnerships that we have currently especially the partnership with one carbon world that we that we have in in order to develop more novel ways of financing the sustainable transition of um, of farmers yes that makes a lot of sense and like we know that farmers obviously we'll want to see the data and you're supplying the context, very, very important. Now we all know that agriculture has the power to make a real difference for our soils and planet. And it's also said that regenerative agriculture presents a win-win situation for farmers and the planet, which you've alluded to. Why do you think that is, Constantine? Soil is the second biggest carbon sink on the planet after the oceans. And giving it the, 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 the power to be able to absorb um, the, the excess of CO2, which we have in the atmosphere, 
it's it, it's it's a win for the farmers because they definitely need that resource in order to grow sustainable crops and it's a win for for society and for the for the environment because we are cleaning that excess co2 and storing it in a sustainable way that's extremely clear thank you <laughs> joe what let me get your thoughts so to my mind, there are no simple solutions to the joint challenges that we face as a society of um, producing sustainable um, uh, nutrition for 10 billion people by 2050 and um, you know, reversing and uh, improving the state of our international uh, ecosystems and, of course, our climate. You know, there are no panaceas. There are no, no silver bullets. There are no simple solutions. Whatever we, um, you know, in order to achieve those two incredibly important goals, Goals, you know, we will have to utilize a, a basket of um, interlinked uh, techniques uh, to, to achieve that. Now, regenerative agriculture is really interesting because it actually, as a, as a system, it, it's, it's not tightly defined. There is an awful lot going in within those five key uh, principles of regenerative agriculture. It is an incredibly uh, flexible system to see to suit individual um, regions of the globe, individual farms, even individual fields. And that's what makes it, um, I believe, quite a robust means of approaching those twin challenges of sustainably feeding the planet and helping to regenerate our natural environment. So what farmers are going to have to do at the farm level is to choose the regenerative agricultural practices which suit their individual systems and the key um, and you know here at the Allerton project you know, we have identified um, around 20 um, sort of if you like um, broad agricultural practices that farmers can institute now not all farms are going to be able to implement uh, all 20 of course not it will be very dependent on soil type on climate uh, and of course, on the type of farming that you are conducting. Now, uh, the reason that um, you know regenerative agriculture, and of course, you know that some people think that the term regenerative agriculture is is overused, or uh, people believe that potentially regenerative agriculture needs to be more closely defined. But I think one of the strengths of regenerative agriculture is its flexibility, and the reason that it's a win-win for farmers and the planet is that the hope is that as regenerative agricultural systems develop on farms, um, that you will be able to see in improvement in your soil health and improvement in your soil structure and it's soil which is at the absolute heart of uh, regenerative agriculture soil health um, now more healthy um, and well-structured soils with higher levels of organic matter in them are going to be more fertile soils more productive soils and more resilient soils so for the farmer the hope is that not only will regeneratively uh, regeneratively farmed uh, soil help to improve the resilience of your farm business, especially at a time of increasing climate change. You know, as, uh, as droughts and floods become increasingly common, um, you know, we need our soils to be more resilient, to be more robust in order to safeguard the production of the food that we, that we have on those soils. So the hope is that for farmers, regenerative agricultural practices will improve that resilience, whilst at the same time, hopefully reducing our requirement for often very expensive um, synthetic inputs. So things like um, nitrogen fertilizers, if we can reduce our use of those things, then we can again make our farm businesses more resilient by making us less reliant on those external inputs again which especially in recent years have improved to be incredibly volatile and at times incredibly expensive but again then we're looking at um, that climate and that um, uh, ecosystems angle where hopefully again that healthier well-structured soils uh, with higher levels of organic matter are going to provide more ecosystem services for example cleaner water and cleaner air uh, whilst at the same time hopefully again uh, sequestering carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, locking it up in our soils, and thereby hopefully acting as one uh, one means of uh, of um, of reducing the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, and thereby combating climate change. Because it's not enough just for farmers to reduce their uh, their emissions. You know, we have to look at how we, pretty much uniquely in um, in the economy, can actually reduce uh, the impact of climate change. Not just reduce our own contribution to it, but but actually potentially, um, you know, uh, reduce wider societies, um, uh, wider societies impact on the climate as well by by sequestering those CO2 emissions on our farms. So, again, that's why it's um, potentially regenerative agriculture when it's conducted well 
is a win-win for both farmers and for society and the wider um, wider environment. Great. We also have some questions for each of you because we'd love to hear a bit more about your organisations too. Let's start with Joe. Can you tell us um, what is GWCT and the Allerton Project? What are they doing for regenerative agriculture in the UK? And how might this change the perspective of farmers? So here at the um, GWC Talenton Project, you know, we for 30 years have been doing um, research into more sustainable farming uh, methods. So uh, we are a working uh, conventional farm. So we have arable and livestock on our farm as well as, as woodland uh, and water courses. Um, but alongside that, we have a full-time team of, of research scientists here who have been conducting you know, research since 1992 into how we can essentially manage the landscape um, in, a, in a more sustainable way uh, alongside food production. So that's what we do here at the Allerton Project. And of course, in, in recent years, we've had an increasing focus on what might be you know, broadly termed regenerative agriculture, and especially around soil health. You know, we're very lucky to have our own soil scientist here. So we've been doing a whole series of long-term experiments to work out how we can essentially um, manage our soils more sustainably. And then hopefully the, 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 the results of that that we can demonstrate to farmers is not only an increase in farm business profitability, but also an increase in the natural ecosystem services that soil provides. And that's what we, we can demonstrate here. Now, the important thing here to, to mention potentially, is so we, we, for example, at the Allerton Project farm on heavy clay soils. So soil type is a huge um, factor in um, uh, you know how farms are operated and you know yields that farms can produce and in how they respond to the various elements of climate change that we're seeing um, feeding through our, our global system at the moment. And what is an important thing to to um, to be able to, uh, if you like, demonstrate to farmers that come here? And we have um, you know around two thousand people a year visit us here at the Allerton Project to see the work that we do. It is important to be uh, completely open and honest with everyone. So we are huge advocates of um, you know regenerative agriculture, conservation agriculture, and, and these other terms uh, of more sustainable food production. But um, you know moving down that regenerative path essential as it is for the long-term health and productivity of our soils and of our farms and of our food system does not necessarily mean automatically, for example, that everything uh, is, is improved. So, for example, on our long-term um, you know, conservation agriculture um, slash regenerative agriculture trials here, we can demonstrate a higher level of farm business profitability because of the more resilient nature of our soils uh, and because of some of the huge cost savings that we have from reducing our reliance on uh, you know, often expensive synthetic inputs from off the farm uh, that are usually derived from fossil fuels. Um, but our yields here, um, you know, do, for example, uh, we can demonstrate a short term, at least, reduction in our yields. Now, um, farmers often will look at that and go, well, I don't want to see a reduction in my yields. That's, you know, that's that's always going to be bad for my farm business. But we can actually demonstrate that alongside the cost savings um, that um, that we can uh, that we can show from our long term trial work here, actually, although we'll see a slight reduction in yield uh, on our on our more regeneratively farmed um, areas of the farm here, we can demonstrate an increase in farm business profitability at the same time as showing hugely increased um, levels of, for example, soil biodiversity, worm numbers, and even above ground biodiversity in things such as um, uh, winter overwintering birds on our regeneratively farmed arable land. So again, it's really important that farmers perhaps look at uh, the future with a slightly different view to how they have looked at the previous you know 40 or 50 years where yield was um, the absolutely dominating uh, factor when it came to farm business planning so that that does potentially require a change in mindset um, but that's really important that farmers can come to places like the Allerton Project and have those discussions. You know, is yield the only thing you're interested in or actually is, um, you know, uh, farm business profitability where your um, main interest lies? And if that can be demonstrated to be better under a regenerative system at the same time as being better for the natural environment, especially as, of course, um, ecosystem services start to become financially rewarded, both by public and private money, then that is what we're, we're trying to demonstrate here at the Allerton Project, that you can have that sustainable food production alongside a thriving natural environment and um, greater business profitability by, you know, by following these more regenerative
regenerative farming practices. Um, so yeah, that's what we hope to be able to demonstrate here at the at the Allerton project. And it's not always an easy conversation to have, um, you know, with with farmers. Um, but you know, that is that is why we we like to have them out here and to actually be able to demonstrate you know, in the flesh, um, you know, what can be achieved. Joe, thank you for that. Super interesting. Constantine, let's come to you. And I'd love to hear a bit more about your new regenerative agriculture project in Bulgaria. And why do you think it's important for your country? Thank you, Lucy. Agrofar is a company that was started in 2021, just after the first waves of the pandemic. And our focus is the farmers transition from conventional to regenerative farming. We developed software solutions that analyze a lot of agronomical data from soil analysis to climate conditions and satellite data in order to give these tailored decisions that I mentioned earlier, which will help the farmers make the right choices when they begin going on that route um, towards the regenerative um, level that they want to that they want to get to in order to become sustainable to lower their costs because regenerative farming it's definitely linked to lower cost of production so therefore they'll become more profitable and another way that we that we wanted to add is with our collaboration with one carbon world that our our project for bulgaria is stepping up the game when it comes to providing farmers with extra financial aid in order to sustain them in that transition. I believe the work that we've done so far is is quite substantial. It's the first project of its kind in Eastern Europe, even in Central Europe. And it's quite quite revolutionary what we are trying to achieve. It will really empower farmers to look a little bit further, a little bit deeper, not only in the financial sense, but in the impact sense. When when they see the numbers, it really makes a difference. So far in our discussions, they, they especially younger farmers, second generation, third generation, they're extremely interested in the impact that they do, in the quality of food that they produce. And that's why giving them that information about why regenerative farming is important and and how does that translate into figures into numbers into data it really opens their mind into what what agriculture could actually achieve and it's not just about producing the food it's way more than that this is really fascinating and i'm sure that you've got a lot of eyes on this project from people all over the world, um, like waiting to see this data. It also strikes me that it's something that could help with the the pipeline of growers and farmers. We're always talking about, you know, young people in many rural regions not wanting to go into farming. So this is all very much part of um, trying to stem that loss as well. Um, congratulations on everything that you're doing. It really is a very, very inspiring example. And thank you also for making the time to take part in this episode and for telling us more about the importance of regenerative agriculture. Um, I'm sure you will have converted many, many people <laughs> if they need to be converted. And we'll all be looking out for your project um, in the future and hoping to learn as you go along. Thanks for your time, Constantine. Thank, Thank you. Lucy. Okay, so we will now share a video about the new Kuzamiti agroforestry project in Kenya. Take a look at this and we'll be back in a minute. The agriculture project funded by the European Commission Horizon 2020 project has been fantastic in looking at nature-based solutions, predominantly based in Europe, but with a use case in Kenya has really been an interesting time and fantastic results that we're seeing already. The use case has been involved with um, understanding the carbon removals for, for flower farms um, based in Kenya. Those carbon removals allow us to understand what can we do more to achieve net zero, so accelerate the decarbonisation, not just concentrating on reductions of carbon footprint, which is extremely important accelerating those removals and looking at next steps and actions as well. As part of the project has been accelerated even further to now understand what is net zero and 
And when can this be achieved by if we um, look at our resources in a more meaningful way? This uh, is worked out by using Earth Observation. So Earth Observation has been used to identify land to use to make sure there was no native ecosystems that have been disturbed. You can also reverse back those cameras from Earth Observation over 10 years to make sure that there was no previous uh, forest, for instance, on a land that chopped down and replanted that's, again, causes challenges against the principles of what we're trying to do as well and integrity. Secondly, it's a great way of being able to understand if you imagine one hectare has a thousand pixels on the satellites. And we're able to see them when trees are planted because some of those pixels will change in colours. So a great way of using artificial intelligence before it became popular really. The second part of there is that an understanding when trees have been planted, which ones didn't make it. So it's a sad reality that not all trees that are planted will make that. This is a great way then of being able to look at all the farms around uh, that particular country that have taken part and are able to then infill, uh, offer more saplings to those areas and then seeing that they fell, follow through with it by again looking at the pixels on the uh, Earth observation to see that that's happened as well. So a great way for land eligibility to understand that we're choosing the right land great way for understanding and monitoring you know twice a week satellites can go over particular areas to make sure that trees are planted a great way to make sure that the, the trees are being looked after after all kusumiti means growing trees not just planting them and that's the important part that we've got this relationship over the next 60 to 100 years perhaps for um, helping that forest flourish and creating further biodiversity it's been a fantastic success for the use case in the um, pilot program here in Kenya. And we're pleased to say that next year um, trees will be getting planted around about an April time to identify the right time for the project as well. We're now moving on to the last part of this episode. It's going very fast. Now we're going to discuss forestry, such a timely topic. I think you'll agree. Um, I'd like to invite our guests to join us. We have with us Ian Mitchell, Group Technical and ESG Director of Flamingo Horticulture. Flamingo sort of needs no introduction, but I'll do one anyway, because it is, of course, one of the world's leading growers and suppliers of fresh cut flowers, house and garden plants and premium produce. All the stuff I love. You're very, very welcome. And from Red Lands Roses, we have Disha Copro Patel, who has been the CEO of Redlands Roses for the last two years and at the centre of the company's carbon neutral journey. Redlands Roses is a Kenyan rose farm specialising in growing and exporting spray garden mini roses, as well as tea hybrid roses of the highest quality in a range of around 180 varieties. Wow, big welcome to you, Disha. And we Thank also, you. hello. And we also have Quinn Neely, co-CEO of Kijani Forestry, a fantastic organisation that partners with thousands of smallholder farmers across northern Uganda to plant millions of trees that provide sustainable livelihoods to rural farmers and help reverse deforestation in Uganda. Their ultimate goal is to plant trees that can break the cycle of climate-induced poverty across Africa. Welcome to all of you. Thanks for being here. I'm totally in awe of everything you do. Um, I'm going to start, I've got loads of questions, but I want to start with a general question for all of you. How can forestry projects help mitigate the effects of climate change in Africa? And especially, what is the importance of promoting efficient water management and growing native tree species? Ian, let's begin with you. Yeah, thanks, Lucy. And um, you know, climate change in Africa is associated with various challenges, such as increased temperatures, yeah, changing rainfall patterns, which is becoming more apparent everywhere, droughts and the loss of biodiversity. Our forestry projects and forestry projects we're involved in can help address these challenges in several ways. The biggest one, obviously, we mentioned is obviously efficient water management, and it's vital in regions yeah, where we're facing increased water scarcity due to climate change. Trees play a very important and crucial role in regulating the water cycle. Uh, in Africa and in, in Kenya, they quite often refer to them as the water towers yeah, of Kenya. 
They can help reduce soil erosion, improve water infiltration, and maintain groundwater levels. Native trees you know, are typically better adapted to soil and local climatic conditions, making them much more effective in, in, the, in the conservation of water. Forestry projects can also promote the sustainable practices such as agroforestry, which combines tree planting with crop cultivation. This approach can enhance food security and income for local communities, while also, very importantly, sequestering carbon. Most important, as well as soil health, as some people have already mentioned today, yeah, the impact you know, leading on this for native tree species, because they have, they have a lot deeper rooting systems that can improve soil structure and facility. This also contributes to a better water retention and nutrient recycling in the soil, which is also better for the agriculture and the overall eco ecosystem and health. One of the major things we're seeing in Africa is we find involving local communities and forestry projects can really empower them to take ownership of conservation efforts. And this can lead to a much more effective and sustainable outcome while also addressing social and economic development needs. Brilliant. And I think, you know, the water towers of Kenya, that is a phrase that will stay with me. Thank you very much for that in particular. Now, Disha was nodding at some of the things you were saying, particularly about community. So um, let's go to you, Disha, and, and get your take on agroforestry in Africa. Sure. Thanks, Lucy. So the reason why we as a farm believe in, in forestry projects within Kenya primarily is because it's a quick, efficient and cost effective way to sequester carbon from the environment. OK. So quick in the sense that it's a red, readily available carbon removal solution. Efficient because it's got an important contribution and you know, you've know you got the experts here, Constantine, you've got Jonathan Sutton that have mentioned it's the most effective way to sequester carbon um, from the environment and cost effective because it doesn't require such a large investment. Um, over and above these, uh, these reasons, you also have secondary uh, benefits of these agroforestry projects. I think everyone has mentioned this along the way. I just want to summarize them. So, you know, the first benefit being prevention of soil erosion. The second one is that it provides for a cleaner environment because you've got all the pollutants being, you know, uh, taken into the forest. You've got uh, the prevention of flooding because the rainwater is captured within this forest system, you've got biodiversity, and then of course, the regulation of temperatures Within now the context of Kenya, agroforestry projects become all the more important because basically climate change is inextricably linked to poverty. You've got a lot of um, chopping of wood happening in Kenya uh, because Kenyans use chopped wood as a source of fuel for, do, for doing all their cooking. Um, this then leads to deterioration of the soil and then it's a it's an agrarian economy and relying on agriculture. So you're basically getting into this really vicious cycle. So um, the reason why we believe in forestry projects is because this would be one step in 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 helping both mitigate climate change and alleviating uh, poverty in an agrarian agrarian economy. Thank you. That was absolutely brilliant. You packed so much information into that. That was very, very good. Um, Quinn, let's come to you. Any lessons from Uganda that you'd like to share with us? Thanks, Lucy. In Uganda, we're definitely seeing just how important it is not only to be planting trees, but to be planting indigenous trees. Over the last couple of years, we've seen huge changes in the weather patterns. The seasons used to be really consistent, and now they've become much harder to predict which makes it much harder to farm. Since many of the exotic species that people are planting actually need more water to grow, it's really important that we prioritize native species that have adapted over time to flourish in these ecosystems. Quinn, thank you for that insight. Super, super interesting. Now, you know it's time for a question from the pupils of Shinfield St. Mary's Junior School. Let's see what they have to ask you this time. Hi, I'm Daisy, a tree champion from Shinfield St Mary's Junior School in England. I have a question for you. Why is planting and growing trees important for our planet's future? Another great question from these students and really so connected to what we're discussing. Why is planting and growing trees important for our planet's future? Um, any additional thoughts on this? Who shall we go to first? Ian, let's start with you. Yeah, thanks for a great question again. Um, 
when when I was some people said to me, when's the best time to plant plant a tree? Yeah. And it's either you know, 25 years ago, probably when I was thinking about leaving school yeah, um, or today. So I think that's the biggest thing we've got to do is act now rather than actually leaving it go for, for anybody else to, to worry about it in the future. As I mentioned before, trees play a vital role in, in combating climate change by acting as a natural carbon sink, as many people have mentioned. But they also help regulate temperature, we stabilize weather patterns, which we've seen you know, some ter terrible weather patterns in the last few years. And they also you know, reduce the frequency and intensity of those extreme weather events. And we still get the main amount of rainfall in different places, but we now get a lot of rain at certain points of time. The other one I mentioned a little bit about erosion control in my previous bit, but tree roots really help stabilize the soil and they prevent erosion. And when we're looking at maintaining uh, rivers and, and watershed management, yeah, that's actually crucial yeah, in our future of actually looking at our farming practices and our farming areas where we're looking to develop. Um, we've talked about, about carbon sequestration, yeah, and obviously trees do absorb an awful lot of carbon dioxide, um, and they store that carbon, their biomass, yeah, in the soil. And that really then helps reduce the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, yeah, and again, helping to mitigate the global warming and climate change. Thank you. That's a very comprehensive answer. Thank you. Disha, do you have anything that you would like to add? I think Ian summarised it all very well. And the reason why we, again, believe in forestry projects is that it doesn't take a lot. It's it's such an inclusive way to participate in the climate change mitigation efforts. So, you know, as an example, every guest or customer rather that comes to visit our farm, we go out and we plant a tree together and then we put a plaque. And, you know, today we have trees that are 25 years old. So way before I joined Redlands. And, you know, um, when, when our customers come back to see us, they get to see the progress of these trees. And, you know, it's, it's heartening to know that uh, not only is it special to see a tree grow, but also that it's preventing, uh, it's participating in the effort to mitigate climate change. Thank you. I think all your passion comes across really, really strongly. Um, Quinn, do you have anything that you'd like to add? That is a really good question. There are so many reasons why it's important that we are planting trees. Not only do trees help stabilize entire ecosystems, they can actually help bring rain, help stabilize soils and prevent erosion, and they can even add nutrients to the soil to help farmers' crops grow even better. Honestly, it's really amazing all the ways that trees contribute to our climate and to our world. Okay, brilliant. Um, we've got um, some time now to hear about your ongoing projects as well. And I think that would be really, really um, a good use of our time. So let's start with Flamingo as they are part of a new project in Kenya with the support and coordination of One Carbon World. And um, please tell us why companies are getting involved in a new project in Kenya, the, Kuzi, the Kuza Miti Agroforestry Project, and how this can change the vision of tree growing in, in Kenya. Ian. Yeah, Lucy, thank you. Akuzumiti is, is very close to our to our hearts. We've been farming in Africa now for just over 40 years, and we've been farming on the same piece of land yeah, as well. So that's a, a true, uh, true test to our sustainability as part of the business of Flamingo. Many projects have been started in the past, yeah, and they basically have always been about tree planting programs. As a horticultural company, yeah, our vision is actually not just to plant trees. As Disha mentioned, they need to be looked after, nurtured, and they need to grow the trees. So that's what Kuza Miti means, is all about growing trees. Yeah, and there's a multitude of benefits. Yeah? You could say that actually the first benefit is, is great that people want to prioritise their CSR aspects and what they're doing. Um, but we know that the future is going to be very much more about financial and non-financial reporting, the CSRD accreditations that are legally going to be required in Europe. But I think now the biggest one is going to be about we are been, we've been farming in Africa yeah, for 40 years, as I mentioned. We basically have got a social responsibility for what we're doing in Africa, not just for the, for the farming and what we're doing with our own land and what we're doing with, it, with the community and the climate, but the people and the social awareness we're doing. I think that's going to really encourage people that are actively farming in Africa that basically want to be put, putting something back into Africa. And I think that's really going to be the big one that we'll be able to put back and look at our scope three yeah, um, levels and hopefully we can then actually really, really offset or inset that scope three positioning of farming and supplying product from Africa to the UK and Europe. 
such a great project. Thank you for that uh, extra insight. Um, I'm sure we're all looking forward to hearing more about it in the future too. Now, similarly, Redlands Roses is also supporting forestry projects in Kenya. Redlands Roses are known for their beautiful flowers, obviously. But why are you now interested in, in adopting a forest? Tell us more about your tree planting project, Disha, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Um, I think one point to mention is that our concern for the environment is not new. You know, this started since the inception of the farm. And, you know, this was one of the reasons that attracted me as a candidate to come and work for this farm in the capacity of CEO, is that we're actually walking the talk. It's not just lip service. And, you know, this, this concern for the environment started 20, 27 years back when the farm was actually started by Isabel Spindler, a French national who landed in Kenya. And I think this farm serves as an important example to the industry to show that, yes, you can run a profitable farming business, a floriculture business, whilst taking care of the environment. So a couple of the points that I do want to talk about are the fact that the farm is actually set up on non-agrarian land. It's not competing with agricultural land. It's barren land that otherwise would have no, no other purpose. Um, the second thing is that in terms of the cultivation systems, we've got a hydroponic cultivation system, which means that we recycle the water that's used to irrigate the rose bushes. And that means that, you know, compared to a typical farm that would be growing in the soil, we consume 50 percent less water. And we're also able to recycle that water and the nutrients and prevent leaching in the underground, the underground waterways. We also like Ian and I think uh, Jonathan perhaps mentioned this is that we use solar energy to power 30% of our power needs. And then, of course, we've had this initiative for our customers to come and plant trees over the last few years. Um, we've also grown as a farm. We used to be you know, a very small farm. Now we're, we're going to be eventually a 43-hectare farm. So the amount of space that we have left on that farm is reducing uh, and therefore reducing our ability to plant more trees. So we said, okay, well, what can we do to support the effort of uh, well climate change and also there's another initiative in Kenya is that the president has an ambition to plant 15 million trees by 2032 and to rehabilitate around I think it was around 5 million hectares of forest land so we said okay well how can we get involved in that effort and so we said the next best option is to uh, participate in adopting a forest so we're going to work with the Wangari Maathai Foundation she's the pioneer of, uh, you know, uh, planting trees and the Green Belt movement in Kenya. So through her foundation and through the Kenya Association of Manufacturers, we're going to start adopting a couple of hectares every year of forest. And this year we've made a commitment to adopt two hectares of forest in Karura Forest. This is a forest in the center of Nairobi City. That sounds amazing. And yes, the legacy of Wangari Mathai lives on through your work as well, which is incredibly powerful. Where were you before? Just I'm just understanding where they tempted you away from. <laughs> so I'm a returning Kenyan. I always worked in agriculture. Um, yeah, so I'm returning Kenyan. I've always worked in agriculture, but I was before in large scale commercial agriculture. And now I've swapped over to floriculture. See, guys, if you get all your ducks in a row with the environment, you can attract talent like this, uh, which is also a very important part. OK, let's go to Uganda now. Quinn, why is it important to include smallholder farmers in the fight against climate change? And how have you managed to make your project accessible to thousands of those smallholder farmers? Thanks, Lucy. The smallholder farmers that we work with are on the front lines in the fight against climate change. Many of these farmers rely on their crops as their primary source of food and income. So when the weather patterns change and their crops fail, they are the ones that face the harshest consequences. So we partner with these farmers to produce, plant, and grow millions of seedlings across much of northern Uganda. We provide everything they need to grow the seedlings, from the seeds to the pots and to the knowledge on how to build nurseries. This year, we have around 1,200 nurseries and the tens of thousands of farmers that we work with are on track to plant around 10 million trees on their own farms. This helps them to stabilize their local ecosystem and gives them an alternative income stream if we face another drought this year. 
Thank you so much. I think we have learned such great information, amazing insight, and we've really got some stories that we can share from this conversation. So thank you so much to all of you for taking part in this episode and for telling us more about how forestry can save our planet. We're all excited and looking forward to learning more about your projects soon. Thank you all for your time. I very much enjoyed talking to you. Digital technology can have a negative impact on our climate. So, as Soprasteria, a leader in European digital services, we are taking action. Firstly, by developing a set of tools and capabilities to reduce the environmental footprint of our digital activities and engaging our colleagues to be exemplary on their digital eco-friendly practices. Secondly, by supporting our clients to draw their environmental roadmap and manage their digital projects. We've now reached the end of our second episode of this Be A Net Zero Hero podcast. I'd like to thank every single one of you for listening and following this great conversation. We've just learned of fantastic examples on how nature can actually be the answer. Regenerative agriculture and forestry can not only mitigate the effects of climate change and protect our soils, but also bring multiple social and environmental benefits and contribute to sustainable development. Please remember that you can follow these conversations on Spotify, YouTube and Amazon Music. Now, in our next episode, we will be talking about net zero food, drink and logistics. We hope to see you there. And thank you again for your time. <music>